Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm Susan Hennessy. I'm a fellow here in Governance Studies at Brookings um, and the executive editor of Lawfare. Um, I'm very excited to be moderating this panel, um, which is going to be on uh, examining gov uh, congressional government oversight in, uh, and their role in preserving the rule of law. Um, before I introduce our panel, I'll note that we've saved about 15 minutes for audience questions at the end. Um, with that, I am delighted to introduce our very distinguished panelists. Um, I will go uh, from closest to furthest. Um, so first uh, is David Jolly. Uh, David served as uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives from 2014 to 2017, representing Florida's 13th district. Uh, Mr. Jolly has held an impressively diverse array of positions in Congress, ranging from an intern to a member. Um, uh, and has worked outside of Congress as an attorney and political consultant. Uh, he's, frequently, uh, he's currently a frequent politics and policy analyst on MSNBC and CNN, among other networks. Uh, past him is Danielle Bryan. Danielle is the executive editor of the, or the executive director of the Project on Government Oversight, a nonpartisan independent government watchdog whose investigations into corruption, misconduct, and conflicts of interest achieve a more effective, accountable, and ethical federal government. Past her is Charles Sykes, a contributing editor at the Weekly Standard, the host of the magazine's Daily Standard podcast, and an N NBC, MSNBC contributor. Uh, his most recent book, How the Right Lost Its Mind, was released in October 2017. Mr. Sykes is currently a member of the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy, is on the advisory board of the Democracy Fund, and is a member of the board of Stand Up Republic. Past him is Congressman Elijah Cummings, who currently represents Maryland's 7th District in the U.S. House of Representatives and has since 1996. Uh, Congressman Cummings is the ranking member of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Uh, Representative Cummings is also a senior member of the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. So before we dive into what I hope will be a lively and conversational discussion, um, I've asked Congressman Cummings to start us off by sharing some of his thoughts on what the role, role of Congress is in preserving and fortifying the rule of law. First of all, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm sorry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good maybe you can hear me. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I'm indeed honored to be here this morning. And I want to thank the Brookings Institution for uh, inviting me here today and Ms. Hennessy for your very gracious introduction. Uh, for the past seven years, I've served as the uh, top ranking Democrat on the Oversight Committee. I've served with both Republican and Democratic chairmen and with Republican and Democratic presidents. I've seen oversight work well, and I've seen it work poorly. We are in, uh, we have a, a very unique committee. We have a, a duty to conduct independent oversight and then use what we learn to propo propose effective reforms. The House rules give our committee authority to investigate any matter at any time. That's a lot of authority. This is consistent with the Founding Fathers' intent for Congress to act as the ears and eyes of the American people, especially when overseeing how the President runs the executive branch. Our obligation in Congress is not just to fund the executive branch, it is to get the receipts. Our obligation is to root out corruption and abuse of authority. We cannot develop reforms if we do not determine what went, what went wrong. Unfortunately, for the past two years, the Republican majority has essentially abandoned this responsibility. They have prevented our committee from conducting credible <coughs> oversight on a large array of issues. And let me be very clear. This is not a normal way of doing business. It's simply not. Even for Republican chairman investigating a Republican administration. For example, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, our chairman at the time, Tom Davis, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, led an investigation of the Bush administration's response. Imagine that the Republican chairman investigating a Republican president. It's difficult to believe it in today's climate, but that's what was normal. 
Chairman Davis obtained half a million pages of documents from the Bush administration and held nine hearings in less than six months. He issued a subpoena for emails from the top Bush administration <laughs> officials. He got more than 22,000 pages of documents from the White House. And he issued a 569-page report criticizing the Bush White House, federal agencies, state government, and private contractors for their failures. Davis is a Republican. Last fall, the hurricanes that struck Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands were one of the most devastating natural disasters in our history. They resulted in far more deaths than Hurricane <laughs> Katrina. Yet, Chairman Gowdy held n no full committee hearing. He refused to even ask to even ask the White House for documents. He issued no subpoenas. He would not even allow us to vote on requiring agencies to return to turn over documents requested by the chairman himself. He requested the, the, the documents and then would not back it up when basically the White House said, hell no, I'm not giving you a damn thing. That's the climate we're in right now. The problem is that when you look back at the report Chairman Davis issued after Hurricane Katrina, he warned about the exact problems we are seeing again today. He warned that FEMA should have, should have, contracts, should have had contracts in place before the hurricane to provide emergency services, food, and water. That seems basic, but after the hurricanes in Puerto Rico, FEMA had to rush to award a contract worth, listen up, worth more than $150 million to a small business that other agencies had essentially deemed ineligible. They had to cancel the contract within days and people were starving in the meantime. We're better than that. Why has FEMA reverted to its past mistakes? Why did the president head out for a long weekend at the golf course in New Jersey in the, in the immediate aftermath of the hurricanes? Was there a communications break, breakdown between the White House and the first responders on the ground? We do not have the answers to these questions, and they are not theoretical. They can mean the difference, ladies and gentlemen, between life and death. The American people want their government to work effectively and efficiently for them. Oversight is what makes that happen. The name of the committee is Government Oversight and Government Reform. Oversight means you got to have information. If you don't have information, you, you're in trouble. you got to protect whistleblowers. A lot of our research comes from uh, uh, whistleblowers. got to protect them. During the eight years of President Obama's administration, I worked repeatedly with Republican members of our committee to investigate and conduct bipartisan oversight of the executive branch. As I close, in fact, not many people know this, and this is going to shock you, but I signed as a ranking member more than 800 bipartisan letters with Chairman Chaffetz and Chairman Issa. I'm not sure, but that very, mel very well may be a record. The Founding Fathers charged Congress with serving as a truly independent check on the executive branch. It is time for Congress to do its job. We need to hold hearings, obtain documents, and if necessary, issue subpoenas. That is how we will hold this president and this administration accountable to the same standards to which we have held every other president and every other administration. Thank you.
Thank you, Congressman Cummings. Um, I should also note that we did invite uh, Chairman Issa as well, although he declined to participate in this conversation. Um, so I'm going to begin with an observation paraphrasing uh, Walter Schaub, the former uh, OGE director, a, a statement that he made on this uh, very stage. Um, and that's that you don't hear about con uh, congressional government oversight when things are going well. And we've been hearing a lot about congressional government oversight lately. Um, so uh, while I welcome any optimistic panelists to sort of challenge that assumption, um, I do think the task here today is a little bit to dissect a, a bad news story. Um, so to kick that off, um, I'll start with Danielle and then ask David to share thoughts on this question. Um, you are both astute and long-term, uh, long-time observers of Congress. Uh, what oversight actions are you seeing right now that are especially alarming or don't look like a healthy functioning Congress to you? Uh, it was, thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. And it was terrific to hear the congressman speaking with such full-throated defense of the role of the Congress and its oversight responsibilities. Uh, I, I think it's important to to put where we are now in a little bit of historical context. And you saw a sense of it a little bit in the earlier panel, which was talking about the role of congressional oversight when it comes to national security. Something that I've been concerned about, uh, we've been concerned about for a while, is that the Congress, to some extent, has been ceding a lot of authority to the executive branch. You especially see this in oversight of the uh, intelligence communities. And you heard uh, Congressman Schiff referring to trust from the agencies to, to be able to get information as Congress. And, and from our perspective, part of the problem has been that, um, to some extent, the Congress has been allowing uh, the executive branch to cede a lot of authority away from the Congress. So we're now at a point where, for example, the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel has legitimized uh, uh, the current circumstances where the agencies are refusing to honor minority requests. Congressman, I think you have something like 64 outstanding requests that are being entirely ignored, if that's right, because... That is correct. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and so that's just a completely broken system if the Congress has sort of allowed itself to be getting ignored, and now it's literally being ignored. And in particular, two things that strike me as particularly alarming, one um, uh, Congressman Schiff referenced, was in the, uh, in the House Intel Committee's work, when you actually had members of Congress voting not to be able to see information. That's just astounding. I mean, at that point, we actually called for those members of Congress to step down from the committee because you're, you're abdicating your responsibility if you're choosing not to get information. And that's, again, what we saw uh, in the last couple of weeks in the Senate Judiciary Committee when you had members saying, we actually don't want information. Happily, that seems to be stopped this week. But that, to me, is, those are two moments of sort of shocking, uh, inappropriate behavior by Congress. So I would, I would add to that. I would, I would agree with it. I would also add there are multiple layers of oversight that can occur on Capitol Hill. Most of your functioning committees, if they're doing their job, are engaging at least in some level of oversight. So for roughly 20 years, I worked within the appropriations environment. Part of the job was essentially almost to audit some of the more questionable accounts, if you will, to identify uh, spending requests that came in as well as contracts that were awarded and investigate those. But it, was o it is only one function of your standing committees, which is why the importance of the Oversight Committee, particularly in this environment, uh, comes into focus. As a, a student of the institution, I always like to point out there are two areas in which we as voters and as citizens uh, can approach judgment of political actions. The first is in basic moments of integrity, leadership integrity, political integrity, decision making. It is fair for us to make assessments of the integrity with which leaders serve. The second is to begin to examine the structural challenges that have brought us to where we are. And those are two very different things. The first lane has a little more passion to it. Uh, the second is a little more academic, if you will. But look, two examples that kind of highlight where we are in this oversight environment. Though it was a special committee and not the House Government Oversight Committee, go back to the Benghazi investigation, where the majority leader at the time, Kevin McCarthy, in his quest to become Speaker of the House, admitted, admitted that the investigation was a tool to try to hurt Hillary Clinton's viability as a candidate. It was not to get to the to the facts. 
it was to be used as a political tool. We are in an environment, to the congressman's uh, credit and to the points he were making, where the Oversight Committee has become a tool of the majority. And I will say this as a Republican, at the discretion of a Republican majority over the past decade. To his point, it was not always like this. But the current class of Republican leadership has decided that the committee is a political tool that they will use in times of divided government against a Democratic president and that they will not use during the time of the Trump administration. That is simply the reality. We can have a longer conversation about the structural challenges, but the last thing I would add in that lane, and it is a academic answer to a more passionate question, I think we could begin to approach a conversation of whether or not we should give the minority greater tools on the Oversight Committee, regardless of who controls the Congress. Approach it more like the Ethics Committee, where you have an evenly divided committee, equal number of members on both sides of the aisle, perhaps grant subpoena authority to both the chair but also the ranking member, or perhaps create a consensus way to, to issue subpoenas. Some tool that empowers the minority on oversight greater than they are right now, and then trust the leadership and trust, trust the ability of those competing interests, if you will, to function. So, Charlie, I'm interested uh, both in your observations on anything we've heard thus far, but also to the extent that Danielle and David both focused on uh, some negative things that we are seeing occur, um, whether or not you think that there are areas of congressional inaction, uh, inaction in sort of areas of traditional congressional oversight function uh, that you think people also should be paying attention to. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think this whole subject is really a, um, an indication of institutional decay. Uh, the the Congress was not supposed to be a constitutional potted plant. It was supposed to, the Article One is Article One for a reason, and I think the the abdication of responsibility is one of the is is, is one of the tragedies of our time that 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 members of Congress just don't have the pride to say we are a co-equal branch of government. But I think what we're finding out, and I will get to your question, is is the whole system of checks and balances more of a metaphor. Um, and that our system of government, with all of the norms, a lot of it is based on an honor system. And what happens when you have dishonorable people, you know, invested with this, this uncheckable power? So, in terms of things that are not being, and, and, and I'm really glad that Congressman Cummings uh, addressed this because, you know, I've been told that it's naive to expect a, a political party to exercise oversight uh, to an administration of the same party. Um, under normal circumstances. Obviously, you've answered that. These, of course, not normal times. Um, but I think in terms of things that ought to be investigated, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll give you five, just right off the top of that. And I think the Congressman Cummings uh, highlighted probably the most egregious example of things that were not investigated, the failure of the Congress to hold hearings or, uh, or oversight into the government's handling of the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Is, uh, is 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 frankly indefensible. There's 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 no there's no possible justification for that. But that's also true on a number of different uh, areas. Why do we not have uh, congressional hearings, public hearings about what is happening on the border with the separation of children? You know, how did this become a strictly partisan issue? Why does uh, every, everything that we're finding out, you know, we find out on television, but members of Congress have not exercised oversight into. Uh, what, it, what appears to be either in reality or potentially a humanitarian uh, a crisis, and of course, certainly a bad moment for uh, the American brand, which, by the way, I hate that term brand. Um, I think it was Senator Whitehouse who used the term open corruption. Um, I think that this is obviously one of the areas to, to have Congress begin to ask about conflicts of interest, um, about, in fact, um, the the wh wh whether or not there are elements of kleptocracy in our own in our own system, and just based on the news in the last 24 hours, this would be a great time to have congressional hearings about uh, income tax forms, <laughs> um, and 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 ask some fundamental questions about uh, not just the president's uh, in income tax forms, but but really, frankly, as as a, as a larger investigation of the manipulation of of the system. Um, and obviously, uh, and I'm going to get to, to Russia and the, what Congressman Schiff has talked about, um, it is one thing for Congress to fail to exercise its watchdog functions. But in the area of the Russia investigation and the House Intelligence Committee, they not only have failed to be watchdogs, 
they have made the, the conscious decision with the support, unfortunately, of congressional leadership to be lapdogs and to, to go from not asking these important questions to actively enabling some of these behaviors. And I, and I think that's going to be one of the darkest uh, moments in congressional history. And finally, um, I would certainly hope that the next Congress on this issue of the rule of law will ask very, very tough questions about the communications between the White House and the Department of Justice, the communications between the White House and the FBI, to really probe into um, whether there is undue influence, um, political influence over these processes, because this is really the nexus of the rule of law when you have a president who I think is, is either ignorant or, or actively contemptuous of the rule of law. And right now, there are communications going on um, within the Justice Department, within law enforcement, and within the White House that I hope that we will learn more about um, with congressional oversight. So, Congress uh, Congressman Cummings, everyone uh, thus far has sort of spoken about institutional decay and these, these structural issues that really are rooted in, in a, a form of partisanship I don't think we've quite uh, seen before in the legislative branch. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to some of these specific challenges of conducting oversight in the minority. So um, what are the tools that you need? What are, what are the specific issues that, that you're coming up against as the ranking member? Yeah. That's a great question. The first one I've already talked about is being able to get information. Let me tell you, if you cannot get information on our committee, you might as well go home and uh, and play golf, even if you don't play golf. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Um, you, you, cannot, you cannot do it. Um, and Charlie made a great point. Th this, is, this is just not about the business of the, my Republican friends laying back and letting things happen. They actively become defense counsel for wrongdoing. I mean, that's a double whammy. I mean, think about what I just said. We're supposed to be the check. And so what we're doing, we, what we find ourselves doing is trying to get them to be accountable, not, not only get the president to be accountable, but get the Congress to be accountable, which is very, that, and that makes the, the job extra hard. The, uh, the thing that, too, that gets to, to me is when we're trying to investigate things that affect the American people on a day-to-day -day basis. See, we, we just don't deal with exposing what our president and the executive branch is doing. We also have a duty to try to address things that are affecting Americans on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll give you an example. Prescription drugs. Um, this has been a big deal that uh, personally of mine that I've made a, a big priority. You have to beg, literally beg and plead to bring in somebody like Shirelli who's, uh, who jacked up the price of, of uh, life-saving medi medication a thousand times. And, 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 and so, but in most instances, they will not even allow us to even bring people in like that. Because, again, we're trying to do what? Address the things that go to the center of people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that, that, that's the, and so, so then what happened? Now, a lot of people are gonna be shocked when I say this, but one of my best, uh, I guess one of the closest people to me in the Congress is Meadows. Go on, fall over. We, I mean, we, there's some things that we're able to agree on. And, 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 and I, I say, Meadows, if we can work out some things for federal employees, with the things that we can agree on, 98% of the stuff we disagree. But we get along. But, so I, I'm trying to get what I can to help people every day. As a matter of fact, the meeting that I had with the president, and uh, over a year ago, that's what we went. We went to him. I went to him about prescription drugs, trying to also 
create a situation where we could then get effectively and efficiently something done. We couldn't. But let, let me just say this, and I, 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 it'll be a medical, I mean, uh, legislative malpractice if I don't say it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen to me carefully. I've said it, I said it when Hillary and and President Trump were running against each other. I, and, I, and I told our Democratic caucus, I said, this is bigger than Trump. This is bigger than Hillary. This is about the soul of our democracy. And it really is. Um, I, I think we are in more trouble than we think we are. And I, 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 and I really mean that. Um, the other thing that we, we find, when we first came in, you were asking about an impediments. When, when uh, President Trump first came in, he basically told the uh, employees in the various agencies, you can't even, you can't talk to your congressman about anything you're concerned about. What does that do for a whistleblower? And basically, and so we, 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 we find, again, information, particularly in this climate, when you have a president who says, you know what, I'm going to do it my way, and the hell with you. And there is no, hello, there is no accountability. There's no, no, none, none. And that's, and tell you're right, it's, it's absolutely, it's ridiculous. And I feel so, I feel, I feel that what has happened is the president has now, he's in, he basically controls the legislature. So yeah, I mean, that's one third of, brand, one third of our government that, that, is, that he controls. Of course he controls the executive branch. And as we are debating about Kavanaugh, keep in mind that the courts are being flooded, the law courts with very conservative judges that will be around for the next 30 or 35 years. And I'm sure there are a few of them probably don't even qualify to be in traffic court. <laughs> no, I'm serious. So, I mean, so that's what we're dealing with. And it's a lot, but anyway, let me. As, as I'm hearing the congressman talk, I'm realizing that things have really accelerated just in the past year. It was only a year ago that uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee was having, the same Senate Judiciary Committee everyone was watching th in the past week, was having really remarkably civil hearings. I was testifying along with a Watergate prosecutor, Ben Venista, Richard Ben Venista, and uh, Charles Tiefer from the Iran-Contra, and what they were trying to figure out was what is the role <coughs> of the Congress in concurrent investigations while there's a criminal investigation. And it was Senator Whitehouse and Grassley uh, and, and Graham and Klobuchar all talking about it was interesting that they were trying to figure out what is the role of Congress, but that was a genuine question is, how does the Congress operate? And you know, all of us were testifying that there's an absolutely a role for Congress, uh, including looking into criminal wrongdoing, but certainly looking into all the potential wrongdoing that isn't criminal and won't be looked at by the Mueller investigation. But, but that's sort of looking into the past, but also looking into the future. Are our current laws adequate to maintaining the kind of rule of law that we require and expect? And that's a, an essential part of why we have congressional oversight as well, is to figure out whether we need to change the laws if they aren't up to the task. So before we turn to questions sort of for, for Charlie and David, I'll leave you with, um, with a sort of a, a final question, and that's that um, we've been talking about uh, Congress functioning as a co-equal constitutional branch and its legislative capacity as opposed to just its partisan capacity. Um, we're also seeing something pretty unprecedented occur within the executive branch, and that's the executive branch essentially attacking itself. You have the President of the United States calling out civil servants, sometimes by name, criticizing the decisions of agencies that he himself controls. Um, what do you view as the role, if any, of the legislature in the face of, of this really unusual uh, circumstance? I think they have a very specific role that they have resigned over and failed to uh, to assume and it is because these behaviors we're seeing of the executive branch are either outside of the constitutional authority of the executive or outside the practices of the executive either way it is within the jurisdiction of a co-equal branch as as Charlie said article one branch to investigate and look into and I appreciate Congressman Cummings providing some urgency to this because I agree 
very much with that urgency. And my concern after 20 years of, of working on or, or with the Hill, I came of age working for a member of Congress who ultimately served 43 years. He was the longest serving Republican uh, on the House at the, uh, on the Hill at the time. And it was a different generational leadership, a different respect for the institution, a different understanding of the awesome responsibility that the Congress is vested with. And I would say now more so on the Republican side than the Democratic side, that's just a, an assessment I would make, we have a generation of political leadership that has come of age in a very different environment. And we can discuss the contributions of gerrymandering and closed primaries and campaign finance and the media to what has created this style of political leadership today. But consider the, the decisions that are being made by Republican leadership. We are still within, I believe, a month of an anonymous op-ed to the New York Times suggesting that the President of the United States is not fit to carry out the duties of the office. I've had personal conversations with national security staff that has been so deeply concerned that the President does not understand the basic functions of national security that they've resigned from the office. What does this generation of Republican political leadership want to investigate? Hillary Clinton, who hasn't been in office for years. And I'm not suggesting we drag the author of this op-ed in front of the nation. Frankly, I think that would be bad for the nation to have this debate under the spotlight of an open hearing. But to suggest that these allegations have been made by a White House insider about the chief executive's fitness, and there is not at least a private interview between oversight actors on the Hill and this individual and other members of the administration who have left over the same concerns, gets back to one of the first points I made, which is it is fair as voters and citizens to make raw political judgments about the leadership integrity of the people who currently occupy offices on Capitol Hill. Well, Susan, your, your question goes back to how not normal our times are. You know, the, the fact you have an executive branch that is divided, um, you know, um, among themselves. I, I, I think part of this is also getting members of Congress, though, to rethink what their role is. That, that this oversight function has become more important rather than less important, even though it's been downgraded. But they need to start redefining themselves as tribunes of the people rather than, as Congressman Cummings points out, agents of a political party, or even worse, agents of the administration. Because right now, I do think that you have a lot of members of, of Congress that see their role as the defense counsel for the Trump administration, which means that they've decided that their partisan agenda is more important than their constitutional responsibilities to provide the check and balance. I mean, that's, that's a fundamental question about what do congressmen think they are there for? What is their role? One last point, though. And I just want to sort of toss this out. I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, I, I, I had the nagging sense last week that what we saw with the Kavanaugh hearings and the Senate Judiciary Committee may be a preview of what oversight hearings are going to be like in the next year. And I do think that, that people in the, both the majority and the minority might want to think through how that is going to play out. Because what we have seen is the rolling delegitimization of any independent check on this administration, whether it is the press, whether it is uh, the intelligence communities. And if, in fact, this is mishandled, it's over the top, it is hysterical, it is not fact-based, um, I don't think that it will solve the problem, that it will just simply play into the increased tribalization. So I just throw that out. Imagine, you, I, th I think you saw what the playbook of the Republicans will be. You know, that a lot of other, you know, you know, congressmen are thinking, hey, I can be the next Lindsey Graham. Think about that for a moment. Um, and, and, and I think that that's, that, that's a caution. Let me, let, me, let, me, yeah. let me just tag on to that. Uh, you haven't asked the questions that I, I thought you were going to ask, so I'm going to ask it myself. <laughs> the, so how do you deal with all of this? I believe deep in my heart, the reason why I was able to sign on the 800 letters with the Republicans is because I'm trying to do exactly what Charlie said we're supposed to be doing. And there's, there's something that, that, I, that I, if you ever watch me in a hearing, you will understand what I zero in on is integrity. Integrity of the committee, 
integrity of the institution, respect for the Constitution. And if, you, if you're operating like that, and you are truly the check, the check that we're supposed to be, there's certain things you don't do. There's certain things you do. Like you don't go out blocking subpoenas. You don't go out trying to tear down the Consumer Protection Bureau and destroy it, things of that nature. My point is, is that I think this is about leadership. And what I'm hoping for is that we will have fact-based hearings that we will present to the American people and to the Congress exactly what is going on. And we, and, and we will not get caught up in the world where lies are determined to be truth and truth are determined to be lies. Can I, very quick, very quickly, because I, th that's a very good point about the fairness of this process. An antidote from last week, I, I was in the green room about to go on, go on TV, and there was an attorney that I introduced myself to in the green room. And he said, we actually met. I was in President Obama's Legislative Affairs Division for the Department of Justice, and you called me in to justify a decision we made on a banking regulation. And I recalled in that moment our meeting. And the most important part of that meeting, to the congressman's point here, these are not always adversarial meetings. And they don't have to be. But today's Hill has made them adversarial. What happened in that meeting is I brought legitimate questions that have been raised to me by constituents who said, this is unduly impacting my industry. And I think it's wrong what the administration has done. And I went into that meeting with the message but the administration had a very good answer for, what, for why they had done that. And we left that meeting in agreement that there was no additional oversight necessary. So these do not always have to be adversarial, but Congress has to do their job to get to that point. So we'll have time for a few questions. Um, please wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, and since we're sort of short on time, uh, keep it uh, relatively brief and do make it uh, a question rather than a, a statement. Uh, this right here. Thank you. Um, formerly of UNHCR, the Catholic Bishops and Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, but general question. Do members of Congress see themselves as agents of powerful donors whose power was even expanded more by the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United? In many, in, in, in many instances, yes. And that's why I've joined with Congressman Sarbanes to try to reverse that. Um, it's clear, I mean, you, I mean just real quick, the, the, on this pharmaceutical issue, um, I've, I've got uh, Republican congressmen that'll come to me and say, Cummings, man, I love that bill. I love the fact that you're setting up uh, with regard to pharmaceuticals. My aunt just went, got a prescription last month for fifty dollars and and then now now it's uh uh a hundred dollars uh this is great 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 but i can't be with you i i mean i hear that over and over and over again why because dollars and other things so my, my yeah and so yeah <laughs> not everybody but yeah Hi, uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, mine is a combination of a, uh, a comment and, um, and a question. I'm visiting from Africa, from Zimbabwe. I am a human rights lawyer. So part of the resistance, and I, and I follow um, American politics quite uh, keenly, especially since um, this new administration. And <clears throat> the political landscape is becoming... Um, very similar to <clears throat> what uh, we often see in our African countries. So it's an interesting observation. Um, one of the panelists mentioned that um, perhaps part of the solution in, in this current political landscape would be to um, provide uh, the minority with, um, with tools that can empower them We'd also be very interested in, in knowing um, the development of that proposal. Uh, 
given our African countries where generally whoever um, is in parliament um, and whatever interests you are protecting or advocating for is really dependent on uh, your political affiliation, which is usually whoever is in, in, in power at the time. So we'd really like to, to learn about that and see what we can glean from, from that proposal. I'll just quickly address that, and I will admit that the last thing I want to do is, is play in Mr. Cummings' backyard, particularly if, <laughs> if these are decisions in his jurisdiction in the majority uh, come January. My point is, though, in terms of how the House is structured, the House Ethics Committee, which investigates its own members, is a committee, I believe, with five members on each side of the aisle. And at times that makes it work better. At times that on honestly creates a complete impasse. Given the state of oversight today, when you begin to look at the committee on which uh, Mr. Cummings leads, though I don't know politically if, it, if leaders on the Hill would agree to do it, I think there are ways to look at the structure of that committee to suggest, could we model it in some ways after the Ethics Committee, where each side of the aisle has almost equal representation? Could we give subpoena authority to both the chair and the ranking? Could we lower the threshold to issue subpoenas? I think what would happen is we would empower the minority, whichever party that is, with tools. But you would also create an environment where the chair and the ranking would now know they each have almost equal tools, if you will. And it would create an environment that perhaps holds off some investigations or accelerates them in moments of complete partisan failure. A little bit more on that particular question. That's the kind of thing that has been, in fact, happening for decades since about the 1980s. There was a, an opinion inside the Justice Department that allowed agencies to require uh, congressional offices that were not chair of committees to uh, to essentially be treated as though they were public citizens and have to sub subject themselves to the Freedom of Information Act, which is preposterous. It's wrong. It's something that Congress has needed to change and correct for a long time, but they haven't. So we now have an, uh, a more formalized uh, ruling by the Office of Legal Counsel that is essentially legitimizing uh, agencies formally from withholding any information from minorities. Those are things that have to, I mean, minority requests. Those have to be overturned. Those are just absolutely unacceptable. The wrap up symbol, uh, signal, unfortunately. And um, so please join me in thanking our excellent panel for sending their thoughts.